Happy Friday, everyone. Uh, welcome to our Build to Rent webinar today. We're going to talk about the rise of Build to Rent. And before we dive into what's happening within the industry and some of the trends that we're seeing, uh, I want to first introduce myself. Uh, my name is Alvin Taveras, and I'm the president, founder, and CEO of Build to Rent. My background's actually doing corporate sales. So like many of you, I was a working professional, a high income earner, uh, but I was uh, trading in my time for dollars. And while I was doing corporate sales, I worked for companies such as Kogay Pamalov, MetLife, ADP, and most recently Gartner. And while I was working a full-time job, I was slowly building my rental portfolio, doing fix and flips, doing long-term rentals, and paying off a lot of my student debt, paying off my housing debt, and paying off my car debt. And about six years ago, I was at the point where I realized that I paid off all of my debt. All of my debt was paid off. And I had three years worth of income sitting on the sidelines. So at that point, I considered myself to be financially free, where I no longer had to work full time for someone else. And I actually got into real estate from the agent side, uh, primarily for my own deals, just as a full time real estate investor. And I find myself just keep having to help people in different scenarios. Somebody from church wanted to sell their property, like, all right, I'll help you. Someone else wanted to do something and I would help them. People saw what I was doing from the fix and flip side. They wanted help from me. So I would help them. And that just helping people started my first company where I was helping out-of-state investors identify rehab and either sell or rent out their properties. And it got to the point where a couple of years of doing that grew that business quite a bit. And then one of my investors asked me to do new construction. I had no experience doing new construction. I was a full-time rehabber. That's what I did. I liked doing that. I thought you had to uh, get sweat equity into every deal to make the to make the deal work. And uh, I, But I was like, I'm not going to lose a good client. So I helped him do one new build. And then I helped him do three more. And then about a year later, about 80% of the inventory we sold was all new construction. And what I learned by helping him and other clients was that there are a lot of big advantages of going new construction. And they include the insurance savings, the initial cost reduction. New construction is often e cheaper than buying an existing home. Uh, you get premium rents. You, you get uh, certain tax uh, uh, benefits, uh, less wear and tear higher appreciation across the board, new build has a better route. So then we had to rebrand the company. And so we rebranded our company, a uh, build to rent. And uh, that came from reading the book, uh, 10 X by Grant Cardone, where he talked about not fighting for your little slither of the market, by, but by going after the whole thing. And so our brand is build to rent spelled build T uh, what the, the number two rent the category we're talking about today, which is an investment category called build to rent. And that's spelled out with the T and the O. So obviously uh, we do a great job with Google search optimization, a lot of brand awareness, developers, investors, they know exactly what we do because we have the brand. Uh, but when I say build number two rent, that refers to our company. When it's spelled out T-O, that refers to the category name. So I always like starting um, these presentations by asking, you know, what's a simple, but at the same time, a trivial question. And the question for today is, you know, what is this? Uh, you know, people would say, hey, that's like a, a DR Horton home. Hey, that's like a, a starter home. It, maybe that's in some corny HOA somewhere. And uh, the answer is yes. Uh, but not this time. So uh, what we're seeing is actually a uh, a single property that's part of a much larger development. This is called Cypress Bay. And this was actually purchased a couple of years ago by a Goldman Sachs backed fund. Uh, and so this was purchased as a build to rent development. The entire community, uh, including the lakes, the land, the community center, all of the individual single family home parcels were bought as a single purchase for the sole purpose of renting it out. And this is a built to rent development. And so uh, if you do the math, they bought 87, 87 single family homes 
uh, paying out over $45 million. When you do the numbers, uh, you'll find out that they paid over 517 per unit. <laughs> and you're like, well, that doesn't make any sense, right? You run the numbers on that. And it's like, why, why would anyone pay 517 per unit to rent them out, right? Typically you would look at 200 per door, et cetera. Um, and again, and these are more premium builds. These are homes that are three, four, and five bedroom, a lot bigger than what you would typically find for like a, a young couple or someone winding down. Uh, these are also pet friendly with fences and yards and, and even a community pool. So not at all your typical, what you think of as a rental for, for, for someone maybe just graduating college. And so the, the first obvious question is why would anyone buy something like this, especially at that cost per door? And so to answer that question, we have to dive, uh, we have to go back in time. We have to reverse the clock and look at how we got to this point where we are today. And so I always like looking at things from a historical perspective, looking at things from a demographic shift perspective, and just knowing our history in this country and the, and the history of what's happening around the world. And so we have to go back to when we were first kind of designing and developing these types of cities. And what we saw was, well, people couldn't travel far on a daily commute to work. So it often meant that the factory and the town were intertwined. And especially when we started you know, expanding here in the US, you had cities like New York where the factories were right there. People had to travel to work either by walking or taking a trolley or something of that nature. But the point is people had to be close to work. They had to be close. And it was typically in a very dense city. So because you had that kind of concentration where people lived next to where they worked, it also meant that the banks were right next to where those works and people lived. So everything was smashed together in a very concentrated, dense area. And so the banks, the lenders, the financiers, what they saw and what they invested in was what was local and what was around where they were. And so that started to change when we get into uh, coming out of World War II. We have a lot of veterans that saw Europe, saw the landscape there, kind of broaden their horizon. Uh, and there were a lot of young men who went to war and a lot of young women who were here lonely without their man. So when the men came back, a lot of them got their VA loans. They had now had money to buy houses. Uh, the automobile was was growing and, ex and expanding, right? So the, the ability to afford a car. And we started to see a lot of innovations uh, that occurred within our society. And so when these veterans came back, they naturally made babies and they try to find places to um, raise these babies. It often meant that they were going more into the suburbs and driving to work into the cities. And so we started to see the sprawl occur. The sprawl was the suburbs that extended beyond the city, still relatively close, but still further drive away. And so even though we saw this sprawl occur, a lot of the banks, a lot of the financing, a lot of the investors continue to invest in the commercial buildings where people work, the factories where people went to, and all of the things that were close and dear to where they were. Uh, so they continued to remain liking vertical buildings, mostly concentrated in urban settings. That was typically what they invested in. Leaving a lot of what was happening further away from the city up to more mom and pop investors. It was very common that if some if a duplex was built, if a small property or single family home was all rented out, typically it was done by a mom and pop, more local investor. Maybe they moved out of the house, bought something new, rented out the old house. Maybe they built a duplex, lived in one side, rented out the other. But it was more, mostly left alone and it was more seen for residential. The common thought process was that instead of buying these properties that were all spread out and far apart, it's much easier to manage an apartment building or a, a commercial building where all the units were combined together. So, um, and that was a norm for several, several years. What happened during the last housing crash, uh, and we all know the reasons why the, the crash occurred, uh, you know, zero, um, uh, just just very um, bad lending practices. People were just assuming that prices were, were always going to go up. 
a, a, a lot of uh, shady deals being done. But the, the long story is a lot of people went bankrupt. And when they went bankrupt, the houses that they lived in went to the banks. And the banks were now stuck with a lot of single family homes and a lot of inventories in places they didn't typically invest in or, or manage in. They were, these houses were designed just for residential properties uh, for people to live in. And the, the prevailing thought process was that um, housing prices would never go down. So the default, if someone went bankrupt, was that that bank could now sell it and still come out clean. Well, what happens when the entire market goes down 20%? Now the banks can't just sell it or they're going to take a huge loss. So what they ended up doing was trying to figure out ways of what to do with all this excess inventory. And some of it was sold by large um, REITs. A lot of times they held some of these. And a lot of these lenders began to learn how to actually treat these single family homes like an investment. And they started selling off these properties now as an investment product back to other lenders or other bonds or other um, or, or other REITs. And then now all of a sudden they began to have an appetite for these. What they started to learn was actually these single family rental homes often perform better than these commercial buildings. They could perform better with low with less risk and some of these factors that they were traditionally investing in. And they became to have an appetite for these now residential, more suburban type of housing. And so there was a long stretch where there was a lot of these cheap homes available that really, if you bought anything, if you waited a year or two, you did very well. And so when the appetite grew for these uh, for these um, properties, you had a now a lot of REITs, a lot of family offices, a lot of um, lenders now investing in these types of products. But then when we got to about, you know, 2006, 2007, 2008, 2009, that stretch of time, we started to see that the prices of these homes started going up as the, invent the, the cheap inventory was all taken up. So there was no longer that cheap inventory that was just readily available. And so what happened was, is when you had an appetite for buying these types of properties and now there's none available, the next obvious thing to do is to build some of these things that you um, that, that that you were previously buying. And if you look at the chart below, I like using the St. Louis Fed, very unbiased, uh, very clean cut. We can all research and review the same data. Is This is actually looking at housing starts that occurred uh, all the way back since the 1960s. And what you can see is after 2009, uh, housing starts collapsed. And so when that housing starts collapsed, it meant that there was no more new inventory coming to market. Everything was all resale homes. And the result of that is, is that as the, uh, as the existing inventory got all consumed, it got all occupied. Now we had to do uh, new builds. And that's when we started seeing the rise of build to rent where a lot of developers would either decide, hey, I could sell this to an end user or sell this to a uh, a, a, a REIT or, or a family office. And they'll say, well, let me just go ahead and sell this to the family office. And, um, and I started seeing like more loans get attached to this. And now we started seeing this trend of build to rent as everyone seeing the same thing that I saw. I thought rehabbing and fixing homes was a way to do it. The banks used to think that, you know, investing in commercial uh, properties and residential buildings was a way to do things. And now we all kind of realize that actually single family homes pan out very well and the appreciation is very strong and people tend to stay longer. And if you write, have the right management in place, it's easy to manage a lot of properties all at the same time. So uh, the obvious question is, uh, what is built to rent? It is a newer term. It's, but built to rent has always existed. It's not a new concept. Any duplex, any apartment building, anything ever built for the purpose of renting out was always built to rent. So this uh, term may be new, but the idea of building something to rent it out as an investment has always existed. It has always been a thing, but there are a couple of traits that make it unique. And so the spectrum it covers single family homes, it covers multi-families, it, it covers built to rent communities, like the example we showed earlier. 
Uh, it, it covers apartment complexes and it covers mixed use development. So some of the things that um, they all share in common is the idea of giving people more space, uh, more sense of a home, uh, more sense of a community. And you're actually giving people the feeling of home ownership a lot of the times uh, without attaching them to a mortgage or tying them down to that property. So across the bottoms, you'll see a couple of different ways that the category is referred to. You'll see it spelled out build to rent, B2R, B uh, number 2R, uh, build for rent, BFR. You'll see SFR, uh, single family rentals. Uh, there's a lot of different terms. They all mean generally the same thing. I mean, single family rental is being a little bit more specific as to the unit count for each property, but they're all inherently all mixed together. And so what they all share in common is a lot of it has to deal with the, the thought process and the approach. And so uh, I'm going to explain the mindset of a built to rent investor, why these developments occur and kind of what they're all set to accomplish. So when we look at the chart in the upper left-hand corner, we're going to see basically the red is females born or, or alive and the, the blue is uh, men born or alive. And we'll see the U.S.'s population and we'll see two bulges that come out. We'll see the, the bulge on the top that is the um, that is um, the baby boomers. You know, have a second group that is the millennials. And so America is unique in the world where a lot of countries are actually looking like inverted pyramids where they have a lot of old people as people live longer. But those people who live longer aren't having babies. So countries like Italy, like South Korea, like China, a lot of countries across Europe, uh, they have inverted pyramids where they have a ton of old people and not that much young people. Um, you have a few countries that have the opposite. If you look at Nigeria, they have a lot of young people, very few old people. A lot of that has to do with lifespan, but it also has to do with just the you know, lack of contraceptives and et cetera. Ten it tends to be that as a country is developing, they tend to make a lot more babies because the 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 um, the humans they're creating their, their children their offspring also help in the family business and they help in in the in the economy of making that family function um, as people get older and they develop those things become less important but what you see in the U.S. is for the most part we're kind of flat we're basically at that reproduction uh, reproduction rate that without new immigrants we're not going to have a growing population uh, in fact we're seeing that a lot of millennials they're hitting um, life, uh, major life events about 10 years delayed. Uh, they're hitting these um, these major markers of like getting married, like having kids, like buying their first home about 10 years after the previous generations have. So we're not going to see another surge of babies coming. It's not happening. Maybe we'll see a lot of immigrants come in and that boosts the population, but we're not seeing the millennials have enough babies to have another boom afterwards. And so, and the reason behind that is one student loan debt, um, two, um, they a lot of them saw their parents lose their homes in the in the in the recession, and they don't view home ownership in the same way that previous ge generations have. They don't view it as something that they have to accomplish. In fact, they often value freedom and mobility and the ability to move around as as being more important. And you can look at that by what they put in their homes. So they're actually buying cheaper clothing, cheaper furniture, uh, things that aren't durable because they don't care about it lasting forever. Like you will not find a millennial with a grandfather clock or a China set, but they don't do it. What they value more is experiences, traveling, doing things, spending time with friends, having unique memories that can't be bought any other way. And so their ability to, to move and to jump around ends up being a lot stronger. Uh, and so what you find is there's a huge shift now to moving to places that are more desirable. So again, if you look at the country as a whole, our population growth is kind of flat, not really growing that much anymore outside of uh, immigration. And what you're saying is that some areas in the country are losing population while some areas are growing in population. So as an investor, you can't just say, I want to invest in America. Right, because America is a very big place and the demographic shifts are going in different directions. So you'll see a lot of the population growth 
is actually happening what we call the Sun Belt. And the Sun Belt, as you see there, includes parts of California, believe it or not. It includes New Mexico, includes Arizona, includes uh, Texas, uh, uh, and all the way through Florida. Uh, what we also find is that if we look at the, the two population booms, baby boomers and millennials, is uh, they're not they're not the kind of people that want to fix things anymore. They're kind of done with that. The Gen X generation, they still fix stuff. They still do things with their hands. Baby boomers and millennials, they're not, they're not big on maintenance. So they're actually preferring to have a newer house where if something breaks, they can call somebody uh, where it's not on them to know how to do everything. They have someone on call. They, they can figure something out. And they, they, they don't they don't need a lot of these uh, unique, cute or artistic homes. Basic cookie cutter is good enough for them. They're looking to just put their stuff in a house and just live there and enjoy it. They, they don't need to feel like they have um, all this attachment to the home. They just want a clean space. So when we look at the finishes, there's a premium on durable. There's a premium on being uniform. It is a premium on being low maintenance. So some of the finishes that you'll often see in a build to rent property, uh, we're seeing the shift going towards quartz ground, uh, countertops as opposed to granite. Uh, one of the benefits of quartz, as an example, is you don't have to reseal it every year. It ends up being very stain resistant. It has a very uniform, clean look. And again, that, that type of uh, countertop is a sparkling white. So it had a little bit of glitter, a little bit of shine to it, but it's uniform. If it was granite, it would have a vein. It could seem, um, it, it can seem uh, not continuously the same, right? It's a natural thing uh, versus quartz is, uh, is man-made. Uh, price points end up being about the same. Uh, um, quartz also does a little bit wetter with, uh, with water or with being wet. So you're also going to see stainless steel appliances throughout your your um, your microwave, your stove, your dishwasher, and then you're going to see LED lighting a lot. So the reason why you're going to see LED lighting throughout the home is you don't have to replace the light bulb. So that's one of the the most common things to when you're someone's moving out of an older home is telling the tenant, "Hey, you're responsible for changing all the light bulbs, making sure." And you find out they're not the same; they're all uniform. And generally, LED, you never have to change them. It makes uh, life a lot easier. And you'll see that the entire house is the same paint color. Uh, and that makes it just neutral for someone to move in. It also makes it easy when it's time to turn over the property. That the property management knows, hey, all of these 80 properties have the same interior paint. I can go there with that same bucket of paint that's in my car all the time and just dab it up real quick and go ahead and go to the next property. So those are some of the common trends we see from the finishes of the home. What we'll also see is that there's more of a sense of home ownership and community design. So with regards to uh, properties, you're going to see a lot more two people living inside of a four bedroom home. And that comes from, you know, coming out of COVID, a lot of people are working from home. A lot of people are working out from home. A lot of people want to have a gym, a yoga studio, a home office, uh, an, an extra bonus room for the kids to play in or for a guest to come visit. So we're seeing uh, the, the shift towards more four bedroom as they have more versatility compared to a, a standard two bedroom that you would often find in an apartment building. You also see uh, backyards. So about 50% of renters today are pet owners. So uh, I like even in my own rentals, I prefer not to have a pet in my property, but if I have a no pet policy, that means that I'm automatically excluding about 50% of all renters. So uh, just logically, I can't do that. So what you do is you just include a pet fee. You do an initial pet deposit. It could be a thousand bucks for a pet deposit and you charge monthly, you know, 50, 75 bucks. But we're seeing that 50% of renters have pets, so it makes sense to include space and uh, policies that include um, pets. Now, you may still want to have a breed restriction or a weight restriction to the pets, but again, that's a very specific property management question. You're also going to see in some larger um, developments, more shared spaces. So there was a study that said that if in an apartment building or in a built-to-rent community, 
that if someone can make a single friend in that community, they are 50% more likely to renew their lease. So just having a friend in that community makes them more likely to renew their lease. So you'll see a lot of build to rent communities or uh, now having, you know, like celebrations together Well, they'll have a new year celebration. They'll, they'll have a, a Thursday night potluck dinner. They'll have a movie night at the center. Uh, but a lot of built to rent communities start feeling more like a dorm room or they feel like more of a college experience where there's a, there's a, a need to want to create engagement amongst the residency. And if we look at the lower left-hand corner, we'll see that there's a, a sharp decline in, in, in rental vacancy. Uh, so quite frankly, from looking at the chart from before, uh, we went a solid 14, 15 years without building hardly anything. As builders went bankrupt, uh, there was no more inventory hit in the market. And so when you fast forward that to today, you'll see that across the nation, there's just a lot less housing available for rent and for purchase. So uh, let's dive into a couple other uh, projects that are happening locally and some of the things that we're seeing. So if we look at the upper right-hand corner, we are seeing the trend. And again, part of this is attached to uh, making renting more affordable. So being more affordable, we're seeing a trend in the rent by the room market. And this happens in a lot of different ways. Sometimes what you will have is you will have a lot of like temp workers that are working on the same area. Uh, think of after a natural disaster, all the all the people that do all the power line crews and everything, they're all going to the same area at the same time. They don't need a whole house for themselves. They just need a room in a house. So that's a rent by the room model. You'll also see traveling nurses uh, traveling in different states and they'll be there for a short time. And a lot of them will prefer to have shared space for both being more cost efficient, but also building a sense of community. So the example we have here is actually a rent by the room model that's actually um, for a university where they'll essentially have four bedrooms, four baths uh, with one shared living room and one shared kitchen. So every resident has their own bathroom, has their own room, but then they share a living room and a kitchen. This is cheaper than each of them having their own apartment. And it also gives them a sense to have a spared, a shared space, uh, build a community, and there's a little bit more rapport going on there. It also makes a lot of financial sense, obviously, for the developer. Uh, we see a lot of what's called spot lot development. You also see this referred to as the missing middle. And so this is you're buying a lot in a community that's a, a residential house, residential house, residential house, vacant lot, residential house. And you'll see a development occur in that vacant lot. And a lot of large institutional buyers are actively in this space and they're buying a lot of these properties. Some of the big ones are First Key, uh, Progressive Homes, uh, uh, Main Street, uh, and America for Rent. So the, the imitation homes, there are a lot of these large groups that are actively buying in these homes. And they were the same ones that were buying from the banks at the end of the, uh, uh, the, the, the foreclosures that were happening during the, the recession. They're now the same groups that are now buying build to rent properties. They're not often the builders, but they are they are often the the acquirers. And then we're also seeing now as certain cities are looking to increase density, we're seeing, you know, in the middle of single family residential housing, multifamily developments being built in right alongside what, what used to be uh, zoned as a single family residential home. So this is a duplex community in Cape Coral, Florida, that's currently being uh, built. And again, it's as cities are looking for more density, uh, it used to be uh, NIMBY, not in my backyard, where everyone was fighting against uh, rezoning single family home residents and pushing people off everywhere else. N now we're seeing um, the opposite, which, which is called YIMBY. YIMBY is saying yes in my backyard, as a lot of communities are looking to increase density, making housing more affordable for a lot of people. So it is a positive trend that if you know if you're in favor of increasing density and creating more affordability. So uh, we talked about build to rent. We expand some of the, uh, we touched on some of the benefits of going through that model. I, I also want to spend some time just 
highlighting uh, how they compare to other investment options. So like my background was in, in fixed and flips. And uh, one of the biggest things that uh, we can say as far as why other strategies um, don't work as well, or why a lot of particularly our investors choose to go the build to rent model compared to other options is because of the hidden costs. There's, um, so what we find is a lot of our investors, they have a core competency. They're doctors, they're lawyers, they're business owners, they're you know working class professionals, and that's what they do best. And the cash flow they receive from the property is not something that they're going to be living off of. It's it's something that's part of their long long term wealth plan. So when you start introducing risk, when you start and risk um, as far as capital risk, and when you start taking and now a lot of their time that gets in their way of their core competency is a lot of times they they <laughs> they 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 end up. Um, having a harder time of actually building wealth long-term with that strategy because there's a sub subtraction uh, as well as a potential positive. So when we look at fix and flips, and by the way, this happens a lot when we go to certain conventions, we'll go to bigger pockets conference, we'll go to some of these big conventions and uh, everyone tries to like cheer people on to become a wholesaler, to do subject to, to do fix and flips, to do, to do all of this stuff. And what they never tell them is just the amount of work it takes for them to potentially get a deal. And then even when you potentially get something that maybe pencils out, there's so much risk that's associated to it in the back end that people who explore those route often don't end up making a decision at all. They end up being so overwhelmed with the fear of making a mistake or just a time commitment that they end up not making a move. That oftentimes at those same conventions, when they come by our booth and they talk to us and it's like, well, well, that's a whole lot easier. So let's go ahead and dive into some of the potential and hidden costs associated with some of the other strategies. One of the big ones is when we look at fix and flips, everyone presented as, hey, I bought it for this much. I sold it for this much. This is my profit. And, and you know, when you actually look at the cost and the effort that it takes to uh, do a fix and flip, like no way is it that simple. And this is coming from someone who used to do this. So there's a lot of cost in just acquiring the property and then eventually selling it. Uh, additionally, there's holding costs. So if you're doing a hard money loan, uh, a lot of hard money loans go over. So now you're paying a penalty for every month you go over. Uh, also, hard money loans are often at 13, 14% interest rate, which is enormous. Uh, you also have to pay for utilities and insurance while you hold on to the property. Uh, including property taxes, et cetera. So it's not like when you buy a property, now that property is free to own until you sell it. No, you're, you're making payments on all the things to keep that house um, operational. Um, and that no one ever talks about capital gains tax, which I find to be hilarious uh, because that, you're going to get taxed on it. Whenever you have a earned income, you're going to get taxed on it, capital gains. The only way to avoid capital gains is to either live in the property for two years and then you can sell it and not pay the capital gains tax or do a 1031 exchange. So if you're doing a live-in flip, that's genius. Go do that. That makes sense. Go ahead and do a live-in flip for as long as your wife will allow you to. Uh, I, I hit my end after two. <laughs> so, so, so my wife allowed us to live inside of a, a live-in flip twice. We did it twice. I benefited from it. Uh, the answer now is never again. So if you can do a live and flip, make sense, go ahead and do it. Uh, otherwise, flipping just doesn't make sense, including like uh, if you ever have multiple crews in the property and then you have the equipment missing, that's stress. Uh, having to go to the property, opening doors, going home smelling like sawdust. Uh, th there are so many uh, downsides. And also, particularly in today's market, we're not in a market where we can all predict that tomorrow we'll, we'll have better numbers. Right. There was a time period where you could buy anything four years ago. And if you held on to it for a year or two, you were going to appreciate. We're not in that market anymore. Now, now, if you're in like chances are to get appreciation, you may have to hold on to that property for a little bit before you get that appreciation. But that market's not going to help you. The market may actually hurt you, especially if you're in a higher end or you're kind of in that more riskier um, tier. So uh, fix and flip has a lot of downsides and it requires you to be actively involved in the deal. 
Now, a lot of times when we meet with investors and we talk about buying new construction homes, they think that we're going to talk to them about doing ground up constructions. And we used to do a lot of ground up constructions. And quite frankly, four years ago, we were at a time period where it was frustrating doing ground up construction. We saw lenders get a lot more stiff as to who they were approving. And typically what lenders were looking for is they wanted the investor to, ha to have um, built at least five properties in the last two years. A lot of our investors didn't meet that threshold. So now we were having to go the hard money route. Hard money route for construction loans is going to be 14, 16%. Uh, that's expensive. And if you do the math over the course of a year and a half, you're not going to make any profit, which makes no sense in even building something if you're not going to have a huge equity position. The whole point of doing ground up construction is to hopefully be at a great equity position when you close on it. If you don't have a great equity position, what's the point? And so the cost of financing the construction was so big that it would erode any potential benefit we would have at the end of a year and a half. So we just skip it all together. Ad additionally, there's an opportunity cost. While you buy land and build it, there are no tax benefits. There's no tax benefits on raw land. You only get tax benefits on improved property. The property is not built yet. Um, there's also no cash flow that you're receiving for that year and a half or two years that the property is being built. Uh, there's no debt pay down. Uh, so you, when you're, um, when you buy the land, you're likely paying cash for it, which means there's no, you're not paying down the debt. You're not even taking a loan on that property. Uh, and, and so there's no benefits from a cash flow, from a tax be benefit or a debt pay down perspective. And any appreciation that you would have had in that time period would have been the same appreciation you would have had if you purchased a completed property. So the appreciation ends up being flat because you would have had that benefit e either way. There is also the, the opportunity cost of your money basically not going to work for you. So if you spend 40K on land, right, there's no return on investment on, on that lot. Um, if you have to buy, pay for these closing costs, um, property taxes, et cetera, there's, there, there's no functional use for that money besides hopefully potentially getting you some sort of benefit in the future, but currently there's none. Uh, and you're now waiting a year and a half to have something. So that money could have been sitting in an account that would have earned something for you while you have it invested in this new build, is not earning you anything. There is also something that comes from the uh, the cost of labor and materials going up. So there is not a single builder who's looking forward to losing money on a home. So when their costs go up, they move those costs over to you. Now, sometimes there'll be a cap in how much they can upcharge you. But quite frankly, if their cost of lumber goes up, if the material costs go up, if the, the skill cost goes up, they're going to come back to you and they're going to say, hey, uh, the price went up, uh, your price went up. So now you got to either pay the difference or find another builder. And so that's another inherent risk. So we have it listed here as an additional escalation clause that they may exercise, an additional 15K that you may have to pay to match the increase in labor and material cost. Or you have to decide to buy another, to find, to build with another builder, which no builder wants to do. And any builder who takes over another builder's job is going to charge you a premium because this is a one-off property. It's a one-off model. It's not like you have 17 of these lined up versus if they were working on their own models, they have 17 of them lined up. And then you have to deal with market fluctuation. So after not making money uh, for about a year and a half, you're now going to have a completed property in an unknown market. So when you factor in all of these risks, again, we asked, we have an estimate of $46,000, but quite frankly, it's just not worth it. <laughs> it makes absolutely no sense. The other part is buying a property that's old, buying an existing property that's older. And I don't care whether you're trying to do a light rehab or you're just going to buy it older and maintain it. The problem with buying a property old is oftentimes you're not getting a discount because you're buying it old. Oftentimes you're just buying an old property with unknown headaches. Uh, they have no warranty on them. Uh, and, uh, and you don't know what was done, whether things were done with permits, how repairs were done. Uh, and you're also very close to a lot of expenses coming due. 
So the way that we do this is we actually worked with the Anitra, um uh, repair costs, just looking at the age of a homes and when things expire in the homes. So if you just add up the list of things that are going to expire in the homes post 10 years, again, interior paint, you should paint every six years, exterior paint every 10 years, refrigerator 10 years, you go down the list. And the biggest one is your roof. Well, if you bought a property that's 10 years old and that roof is only set to last 15 years, that means within five years, you're going to have about 20K expense to replace that roof. And I always ask the question of what's your ROI on a brand new roof? Let's say you invest $20,000 on a brand new roof for a 20 year old home. How much can you increase the rent now? Well, the answer is none because your tenants don't care if there's a new roof there. They only care if it's leaking or not. So if it's not leaking and you replace the roof, uh, that's not helpful. If the roof is leaking, that's just a problem. If you fix it, that's not a benefit. That's what you're supposed to do as a landowner. So uh, so there's no ROI on replacing the roof. You can't increase the rent and the value of the home does not go up either. If you look at an appraisal report, they will never mention the age of the water heater, the age of the roof, the age of the air conditioning. None of those things get reported on an appraisal report. Now, it may help with someone wanting to buy the property. Maybe you get a little bit more interest because the roof is new, but they're not going to pay that full 20K that you paid for that little bit of extra benefit. And it's definitely not going to appear on an appraisal report. So when you buy an older home, you're close to a lot of expenses being due that you could just avoid if you bought a brand new property. So you could say instead, hey, let me buy a brand new property. Let me enjoy everything being brand new. And at that year 10 mark, I can sell this thing and buy another brand new property. And now all these repairs will be someone else's headaches, but they're off of my plate. Additionally, what you'll find is that insurance costs is also more expensive when you buy an older property. And also the rental demand for that property is also less when it's an older property. I mean, all of us would prefer living in a new property versus an old one. So your tenants are going to do this, the same exact thing. All right. So we got to the point where I got you guys sold. Uh, build to rent makes a whole bunch of sense. You're not going to become a rehabber. You're not going to look to become a developer and you're not going to buy an old property. So Alvin, uh, how do I get involved with build to rent? What do I do to go ahead and get started? Okay. So there's generally three paths to invest in build to rent. Uh, the first is going to be a syndication and being a syndication, quite frankly, is the only version that's actually passive. So all of us say that um, real estate is passive. It really isn't. Uh, anybody who lies to you doesn't own a property, right? They're just, they just read a book somewhere. So, but real estate, when you own the property in your name is passive enough. And that's the key part. We're not saying that's gonna be perfect for you, but it's passive enough where you're not having to do the work every single month. But you do have to check in. You do have to monitor it. Once in a while, there'll be they will be an issue that you may have to manage. But again, it's passive enough, especially if it's brand new. But a syndication really is passive. Um, so um, the steps are: you research your options, uh, you figure out who's managing this, you can interview them, you can do your due diligence. But really, once you're done with your research, all you do is send your money. Um, so. With that, some of the benefits are you may receive passive income, which is great. It will just come to you. Not a problem. Uh, you're going to be working with, hopefully, more experienced partners. If they're not more experienced, don't work with them. <laughs> that's that's pretty straightforward. And, and by the way, you will find a lot of syndications that they don't have money to invest. So they create a syndication and try to just get other people to invest because they don't have the money. Uh, don't invest with those people. You should invest with people who also have skin in the game. If they don't have skin in the game, don't trust them because they're just gambling with your money. So don't do that. Uh, but they should be more experienced. They should have an established team. They should be more professional. They should have a track record of success that they can easily you know, now deploy and use as a forecast for these properties. Uh, you should also be participating in larger deals. So you shouldn't do a syndication for a single, single family home. That's something you could do on your own. But if you want to participate in a much larger deal, so uh, there are obviously several downsides to participating in a syndication. Uh, one is you basically don't have any control. 
So if you think now's a good time to sell, well, you can't. Uh, if you think you want to add a fence or do something different, you can't. If you want to convert it to a short-term rental, you can't. If you think that we're allowing, you know, uh, poor tenants or we're not maintaining the property, there's not much you can do. You put your money in, uh, you invested in that manager as a manager property. Uh, there's not much of a say that you can have at this point. You, you put all of their trust in their hands. And that also means if they decide that they don't want to pay out dividends. If right now, a lot of syndications, they paid way too much for their properties. They were thinking that rental rates were going to go up forever. Now they find themselves trapped. They find themselves having more repair costs. The delay in getting the property stabilized took longer. All these excuses. The point is a lot of them are not paying dividends at the moment because they're either building out their, their, um, their savings reserve or they're actually aren't making a profit and they can't pay anything out because there's nothing, there's no earnings. And so um, a lot of syndications are now asking their investors to reinvest into their fund. And so this is a double edged sword. And this is a challenge situation for people who have invested with REITs is that if you don't reinvest, if you don't invest more funds, if you don't, you know, they call it uh, a, a capital call. If you don't put in more money, you're going to get diluted. And so that share that you had is going to dwindle down and more of the share is going to go to the other investors who paid more money into that cap capital contribution. The, the other downside is you're basically putting more money on the line. So there's no guarantee you're going to have a positive return. And if they're already asking for more money, there's not, uh, they may not be an end to their demand for more money. You, they may be asked multiple times uh, across a couple of years to continue, continuously put more money into the deal. The other part of it is that you'll find a lot of uh, managers have managers, have managers, have managers. You're paying a ton in management fee. And it's actually one of the main ways syndications make their money by managing the property. Whether the property performs well, whether it performs poorly, they're getting their management fee and they're good. They're also still paying other property managers to manage their parts. They're, they're paying uh, an accountant to, to manage the books. They're um, paying for a, a legal team to, you know, to, to basically um, be on standby in case they need their legal assistance. So there are a lot of money that's being going a lot of different directions where if you own the property outright, you probably wouldn't be paying all these people. Um, the other approach is, um, is becoming a developer. And this is another way. And we talked about it a little bit. And so just so you know, if you were looking to become a developer, from day one, you have to commit to creating more than five units per year. If you are making less than five units per year, this is not a good idea. Uh, it's, it's not worth all the head trauma you're going to receive. One, because um, in your first time becoming a developer, you're going to pay what's called a dumb tax. Uh, and you're going to pay that in two ways. You're going to pay it one with the lender as they don't trust you. Uh, they're going to they're going to charge you a premium because you're inexperienced. The second dumb tax is you're going to make common mistakes. And so if you're okay with paying the dumb tax because eventually you're going to get better at it and develop a core competency, becoming a developer makes sense. But if you're going to be a one-off developer or a two-off developer and you're going to pay a dumb tax, uh, and then you're not going to keep doing it. It's it's just not a good idea. Just buy an existing property. So much easier for you. But the path to become a developer is uh, buy the land. And and by the way, uh, I I have this out of order. I have this in the way that a lot of people make the mistake. You always buy the land last. Buying the land is the last thing you do. Uh, the common mistake is buying the land first. And the reason why I say buying the land first is a mistake is people will buy a land, buy the lot and not even know anything about the property, not know where the easements are, not knowing where the setbacks are, not knowing what the restrictions are, not knowing the cost to infill the land, not knowing the cost to clear the trees on the land, not knowing if there's any invasive species on that lot, not knowing where the utilities are, what's set up there already, not knowing what the cost to connect those utilities are, not knowing what the city wants to have built there. So if you buy the lot first, you're now like committed to something you don't know you, what you can do with. You don't even know what your cost to go through that process is. 
So uh, the land is always the last thing you do. You do all your due diligence first because you're not actually committed to anything until you buy the land. So do everything first. The last thing is buying the land. You can uh, have um, have a note written. You could have the right to buy the land. You could enter into agreement where you enter into, you have a certain time period to exercise that right to acquire the property. That's perfectly fine. But don't actually put money to acquire the land just yet until you have everything else figured out. So we would often start with the opposite. We would start by working with the architect, working with the builder, and figuring out um, what you want to build and getting some costs. And so you want to know what your costs are um, for the build. Then you want to see whether the market would support those costs by rental rates. You can start playing with numbers early on without any commitments. And then once you get that part figured out, now you can start working with figuring out uh, what the loans are going to look like. And the lender's going to help you get some real numbers and some raw data. And the lender's not going to fund a bad deal, right? At least theoretically, they, they're not they're not going to. So they're going to help fill in the gaps. And, you know, your lender is your partner in this deal. And the lender's going to do a couple of things. They're going to evaluate you as a developer. They're going to evaluate the developer as themselves, their track record and what they've done before. And they're going to evaluate the opportunity, what you're actually trying to build and whether it will actually become profitable. So they are your partner in helping you underwrite the deal and making sure it makes sense. If they say no, you should be thankful, right? You, you, you shouldn't be upset if Len told you no. Instead, you, could, you should figure out like, hey, how do we make this work for you? So that obviously it'll work for me. And then once we get that squared away is then we can start identifying properties where that plan could potentially work. Uh, and so now what you're going to do is, is when you're analyzing properties, you're going to be able to now go back to your builds and say, hey, I'm under contract for this lot. Can you do a study on this lot? And they'll do a field study. And in that field study is when they'll figure out where the utilities are, there's any invasive species, what the cost of the infill is going to be, what the cost of clearing the lot is. So they go back to you and now they'll give you all the numbers you need. Now you have a full picture of your project and your project's cost. Now, if the deal still makes sense, you can go ahead and buy the lot because you checked everything out. Also, I forgot to mention this. You should also call the city to make sure that that's permissible and that they want that in their community. If you're looking to build something they don't want, uh, you know, you should probably know that before you close on, on a deal. So, but there's a lot of downsides to it. So the construction cost is expensive. Uh, as a developer, you are hands-on. This is an active role. You are the person that has to crack the whip if people are going slow. Uh, and it's it, for a lot of people, it feels like a full-time profession. So if you're doing something else, you're going to be toggling both of them. Uh, a lot of these deals take a long time. We used to be able to do builds in four to six months. Those days are over. Now, uh, any builder who tells you they can build in 12 months is lying to you. Uh, you should assume it's going to take about a year and a half to do a whole build. Uh, up to two years, so uh, a lot longer. And um, there's going to be multiple closings. You're going to buy the land, which is a closing. Uh, you're going to do the construction loan, which is a closing. And then you're going to close again. You're going to do a final close on the, with the end loan. So multiple rounds of closing, which all have cost to them. So multi layered. The pros, the, the only reason to do this is because you believe when you're all said and done, you're going to have built-in equity in the deal. If you are not going to get built-in equity from day one, never do this. <laughs> this makes It makes absolutely no sense to get on this path. And again, I'm skewing this for people who are looking to do five or more, or they're doing a much larger development deal, and they're willing to pay that dump tax. Being a developer, every developer I know is bald. I'll, I'll put it that way. There's not a single developer that has a full head of hair. So you will age quickly becoming a developer. If you're willing to do that, by all means, do it. Uh, but you should be aware of the cons. And so um, you get to choose your location as well. You get to customize their property. Uh, some developers are very passionate about how their development looks. Others are just cut and dry. But the point is you get a, a say in how things, and you get to you get to use your creative wit. You get to uh, have some pride in the design of, of the development. The, the cons is obviously much greater financial risk. If your builder goes bankrupt doing their development, like good luck finding another developer. Chances are that developer is not going to release that contract uh, because that's tied to bigger problems they have. So if they 
if they release your contract, now they're reducing the amount of account receivables that they have, that if they're in a lawsuit, they're fighting litigation, they want to show those account receivables because at least they're saying that theoretically I could pay you back. Once they release those contracts, uh, even if they know they're never going to finish it, now they're basically reducing the amount of account receivables and you know they made their own financial picture in that lawsuit even worse. But you are, you, when you become a developer, you are now that person that knows how to handle that situation. Hey, this developer went bankrupt. I can find another one, no problem. I can do a lawsuit. Hey, I, I got to fight with the city on this utility pole. I know how to do that. Uh, if you were outsourcing that to someone else, like you're going to pay more as a result of it. So a developer should have those skills and you're taking on that risk. Uh, you're gonna, it's going to be a lot more involved, uh, a lot more stress. Um, and the big thing here is that most developers, especially when they're starting out, if they have a deal that they're being built, that they're building, they're not doing anything else. So, uh, so while some people are buying two or three properties a year and they're mixing, they're moving, they're doing a lot of things, most of these developers, especially when they're starting out, aren't doing anything else. They're just stressing out about this development. Uh, so that's something you have to be, be aware of that like, if you're if it's not going well, which likely something will go wrong, your appetite to keep buying is going to go away. <laughs> you're not going to want to do anything until this is said and done. So the third path is typically what I would say the majority of our investors do. Uh, again, we, we do some development. We work, we work with developers. A lot of times we partner with them to sell their inventory. Uh, but the majority of our investors are actually um, going to this route where they're basically saying like, hey, I want to do something that I can analyze. I know the numbers to be true. I can scrutinize this deal, run the numbers front and backwards. I can, you know, talk to the property management team. I can verify the rents, but I'm going to pay, um, uh, I'm going to get a discount today, knowing what the the, 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 the property is already worth more. And right away, I'm going to start receiving cash flow, start um, receiving um uh, um, uh, tax benefits, start receiving the debt pay down, start appreciating right away. I want to make a purchase and have it go to work for me right away. I don't want to wait a year and a half. And so the majority of our inventory is within three months of being completed. A lot of it's closer to being completed than even three months. So we're not waiting the year and a half and they have all the benefits of being a new build. So uh, you simply go on the contract and you close on it. There's a, a single close and most of our investors are doing a commercial, uh, a, a conventional loan, uh, which again, we have certain incentives to buy down the rates to make it more attractive to our investors. But that's it. You find a property you want, we analyze it, talk about it, and then you put your deposit down, you close on it the same way as you would any other property. Some of the pros is you get immediate equity. Our average investment is about 10% below market value. So you get 10% equity right away. It's already permitted, it's already completed. Developers already mostly done with it. Maybe there's a couple of trimming things that are left, but that's basically about it. You can actually tour the property. It exists. Either you can view it or we can schedule a tour for you and video tour it, but it's a completed property. It's real. You're not, it, it's not something that you're hoping and, and you can see what it actually looks like. You can see what the neighbor's houses are. Uh, and we get to attach certain builders incentives. So some of those builders incentives uh, include things like two years free property management. It includes a rate buy down, bringing down your interest rate to as low as 3.75%, uh, and additional other uh, closing cost concessions, et cetera. But if you develop a property yourself, there are no incentives. You buy a syndication, there are no incentives. Uh, you buy spec build, we can get you those incentives. The, the downsize of the uh, buying a spec build is that you're not going to pick exactly where you want to be located. Uh, you're going to have to go off of an inventory sheet, uh, analyze the options and just pick from that sheet. So you can't like point at a lot and say, Hey, I want that one. It's, you have to look at what's already available. Um, and they're not going to be customizable until after the purchase. So if we show you a sparkling white granite, counter, uh, you know, a quartz countertop, like, Hey, I want to have granite. It's like, you got to close on the property before you can change it. Most investors don't care, but some do. And you just have to wait until, again, if there's a light bulb and you want to put a, a fan there, you got to wait to after closing to do that. Um, so it won't be done as part of the build process. So um, I, as you guys noticed already, there's been um, talks of how things have changed and adapted to. 
And that's been the industry that we're in. Our industry has been filled with adaptation, constantly changing uh, and uh, adapting to what's happening in the market. But it's it's safe to say that there's always a challenge or a looming challenge. It had always existed. It's never a great time to buy. Any fears you have now, there's going to be another fear later on. And it's always not so much that there's something that's fear that, that you should be fearful of. It's always thinking about like, what's the solution behind this? How do I get around this? How do I troubleshoot this? And so I spend the bulk of my time of actually listening to my clients, working with developers and constantly finding solutions of things. So in 2019, there was the end of cheap housing. And that's when I pivoted. That's when I, I, I saw the writing on the wall. Fix and flips were too expensive. The older homes were costing more than new builds. It absolutely made sense to go to new construction. And we promoted a lot of cash out refis. So if you had a, a, a house that you held for five years, likely appreciate it a lot, good time to do a cash out refi and buy another property. Then we had COVID. Everybody was uh, was at home. We all got our stimmy checks. Uh, we we're all looking to invest. And a lot of times that money went to me. <laughs> uh, so uh, we uh, ended up doing a lot of, we expanded as far as how we operated here and built to rent. And we got a lot more boots on the ground. So currently we have 14 agents throughout the state of Florida and in, in several of the other markets that we're in. And we're boots on the ground. So you want to see, you know, for our investors who are kind of going through all the options, they kind of narrow down the address that they want. If they want a, 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 to see a video of that property, we can shoot that video for you. Uh, we're going to be there for the actual inspection. We do all of those things that are boots on the ground. And we learned to do that because people weren't traveling during COVID. So we became their eyes and ears. So we took on that additional role to provide better service for our clients. We've also started packaging partners together. What we saw was, I think our investors wanted more and more convenience and for us to just have more thought out for them. So we automatically started including having a preferred insurance provider, preferred property management, uh, preferred title company, preferred lender. We had it all mapped out for them so they can simply explore their options and then you know do everything virtually. Uh, then when we got to uh, 2021, we started seeing that there were a lot of construction delays that were occurring. And I talked about this earlier a little bit where the ground up construction route that we were doing a lot of just didn't make sense. Uh, and quite frankly, it wasn't fun. It wasn't fun when we uh, helped an investor um, build a property and every week they're calling for an update and every week we're reaching out to the builder and every week the, the build doesn't tell us anything or there is no update. We're just waiting for permits. And so you do enough of that where every project you're working on gets delayed and you lose your appetite for it. It's not fun for us. It's not fun for the builder. It's not fun for the investor. And that's why all of our inventory is within three months of being completed. I don't want to put a property in front of an investor that I say is going to be four months. It turns out to being a year. Uh, when we get to the point where we're within three months, that builder is at the end zone, uh, is at the red zone. They're looking to, to close on this thing. They're they're at that finish line. And almost everything in the home has been ordered. So when we're within three months, we're pretty confident it's going to close within three months. And that's a better experience for all parties involved. When we hit 2022, we we're at a stage where there was a very low inventory. And so what we allowed our investors to do is to get on a wait list. So when a property became available, uh, they can be the first ones to snag it up. They were first in line to buy properties. We also started doing a lot off market as a result of it. So we started deepening our relationship with our builders, having a hold of their inventory and giving our investors special access to their inventory so that what everyone else was struggling to find inventory, we had a lot of it. And so our business actually boomed during this time period because investors were looking for deals and we had them. Now we got to 2013, which was last year, and we started to see the challenges of higher interest rates. And so the way that we managed this was we started looking at the performa and we started figuring out, hey, if prices went up, yes, rent was up, but also prices went up and interest rates started to go up as well. So we needed to work with our preferred um, lenders and, and our developers to find ways to offset some of these additional costs that they were facing. 
So we started introducing um, buying down the rate. Now, the way that we do this is by getting a forward commitment from the developer to the preferred lender. That lender then uses that forward commitment to buy down the rates. So technically it's a lender contribution, not a stellar contribution. And that's how we are able to uh, manage and package these deals together so we can get our investors interest rates as low as 3.75%. That happens because of our unique relationship and the way that we package these deals together. Uh, we also started you know, analyzing, hey, if we, you know, the cash flow is always tighter the first two years. Once you get past three years, it begins to balloon after the majority of your expenses are fixed expenses, but your rental rates go up every single year. So if we can make property management free for the first two years, that's going to help make cash flow a lot more uh, of a safe bet in that first two years. It's going to give you a lot more cushion. And we know that at year three, four, and five, that, that cash flow spreads only going to get better from there. So uh, now that we're entering in 2024, um, the new challenges is you just can't be uh, wildly optimistic when you do your performance anymore. Right. You have to be a little bit more um, stringent. You have to be a little bit more analytical. You can't put wild appreciation. Long term, fine. Short run, we got the deal has to make sense today using existing numbers. We can't use all this future optimism. So uh, now that we're in the environment where we don't know where appreciation is going to be, we don't know exactly where rent's going to be. We know long term they're going to be healthy, but we got to now work to offset today's current challenges. So what we're saying is we're looking at our data and we're saying what typically we can get a tenant placed within the first two weeks of ownership. Part of that happens because we, we begin to advertise the property as coming soon, a month before it's even completed. And, uh, and then once we receive the CEO, most of our investors don't close until about 10 days later. So we have a window that we can market the property and then we have a window where we can start showing the property, touring the property, that we can actually get an approved applicant within the first two weeks of ownership. And that has been our track record. Uh, but some of our investors didn't believe us. So we ended up saying is, you know, we'll put our money where our mouth is. And for a lot of our inventory is we're providing a three month rental rate guarantee. And what that's saying is, is that if we don't get a tenant placed in that property, uh, that rent will be covered uh, during that time period. Again, historically, we know we get it covered. We got a tenant in there in that first month, but if it takes a little bit longer, you'll definitely get that rental income. And it helps with regards to removing your vacancy. The vacancy comes in two forms, either in the initial time placement of tenant or in the replacing of a tenant when a tenant moves out and putting another one in. So by covering that three month rental um, guarantee, it means that you're not gonna get that, that, that turnover cost at, at that while the property has just been completed. We're now entering a part where we're anticipating 2025 being a time period where the, that challenge, and we're already predicting the challenge, is going to be higher unemployment. So rents may be flat for a little bit. Uh, higher unemployment may be around the corner. And so we got to figure out how to solve for that potential challenge, which is the looming threat that's around the corner. Again, if it doesn't happen, we're happy. But we're preparing for what some people predict will happen. So we got to act accordingly. And so part of it is realizing that you can't reach with rental rates anymore. So uh, there was a time period where when you were banking on higher appreciation, you could buy a more expensive home and anticipate receiving 2,600 in rent. And if that worked out, you did very well because the appreciation plus that higher rental rate was going to be phenomenal. Now we're in a market where we can't predict higher rents and people may lose their jobs. So in an environment where people are lose, where maybe losing their job or can't afford that higher rent, we got to make sure that we're actually focused on affordable housing. So affordable housing is going to be closer to your seventeen hundred to below two thousand dollars, and it's going to be in more dense, more concentrated areas where people can get to work very easily, where there's already a demand for rent. Uh, and again, we're focusing on the the more affordable rental side. And so here's what we saw, and I'll show you the chart in a little bit is that rental rates typically don't decline. If you think about it, if more people lose their homes, that means you're going to have the rental population skyrocket as those former homeowners now become renters. Same people, just in a different bucket, but they're not going to be chasing that $2,600 a month rent 
they're going to be charged. They're going to be chasing something more affordable. So the the demand for affordable housing may only increase as we uh, if we hit a recession or, or hit hard times, which is why our focus is going to be more in that range. Uh, and we're going to be looking to keep our tenants in the units. Sometimes that means not increasing rent as aggressively as we previously have. And so here's the good news, because I was being very realistic for about uh, th those two years, is that your numbers will, can still work during that time period. Like I'm, I'm so actively buying. Uh, your numbers may actually work better if you plan according to the challenges that may come in the future. But my prediction is 2016, we're going to see a re reversal and go back to a similar market that we're coming out of, but it has longer legs behind it. And so, so I am predicting in 2016, we'll go back to low supply and much higher prices. And I'll go ahead and explain why I am predicting that. So one of the things that you'll see is uh, over the last couple of years, we've seen uh, prices generally go up and to the right for the last couple of years. And what we see is uh, we're seeing things dip a little bit currently. And mind you, this is, uh, this is again, using the St. Louis Fed information. This is on housing prices sold in the United States, and this is the entire nation as a whole. So uh, in, our, in our conversation today, we're focusing more on Florida, but this is using nationwide data. So we can tell, hey, the peak already occurred for the nation as a whole about a year and a half ago. A lot of this includes markets like Texas, like, uh, like California. A lot of them already peaked a year and a half ago. Uh, and then nationwide, we're seeing a slight decline, right? We're seeing, we're, we're now... Um, going back to that point of equilibrium. But if you look at Florida specifically, you say like, well, we mostly survived that downturn. Now this is looking at the end of last year. So end of last year still finished up 4.8% year over year, which is very good, you know, given what I just saw you, what, what was happening nationwide. And so what we're currently seeing this year is we're still slightly up. We're about 1% year over year which is like muddling through. Um, well, th that's what we're currently seeing. Even though the rest of the country is getting you know, beaten up right now, we're kind of muddling through and we're being saved primarily because of population demand and just because of the high desirability of living in Florida. So uh, here's where the good news begins is um, if you look at Florida, we're getting massive population growth uh, and they all need new housing. Uh, you know, you're not going to get fit more people inside of older homes. They need new homes to live in. And so we're looking at the building permits in Florida, which is a very important stat for Florida. And what we see is, you know, the building permits, uh, the starts, they peaked in 2021. So uh, looking back at the historical data, we see that in 2005, 2006, was the last peak that we had in construction in Florida. And then we saw a huge drag downward. And so throughout that whole time period, to, to, you know about a year and a half ago, we weren't building anything. Then we had a short stretch between you know, 2021 to you know, 2021 and a half, <laughs> where, where, where we peaked a little bit. And then as interest rates started going up again, it, it became very difficult to continue to fund new construction bills. So we're starting to see peaks go down. They've been going down for about a year and a half. So what it means is a lot of the inventory that we're seeing um, is inventory that started about a year and a half to two years ago. And there's not a next wave of new builds coming to the market. That new, like we're, we are currently absorbing the 2021 peak in construction boom, right? In, in, in the permit starts that we're seeing. So once we get through that inventory, there's not another wave of inventory coming. There, there is nothing else behind it. Uh, particularly when you look at the population growth that continues to go up. So Florida, ever since the invention of the air conditioner has been booming, air conditioning and, and pest control are killing the mosquitoes. But uh, once you solve for those two things, Florida is a very pleasant place to live. And our population growth shows that. And the gray bars you see there are recessions. And you will see that regardless of the economy, people are moving to Florida. And it is solid. It is consistent. 
So when you think about this last chart, we're seeing, hey, we had a time period where we had a lot of this new builds. Keep in mind that that amount of new builds never caught up to what we saw in 2005. So it never caught up to, to that. We were just getting back to the medium and now we're regressing already. So uh, with the population still going up. So my prediction is it may take six months or a year to kind of get through this existing inventory, but prices are gonna be affordable now as a result of that. Uh, so our prices have been mostly stable for the last year or so. Uh, once we get out of and through this inventory, I'm especially with lower interest rates, I'm predicting we're gonna see a, a surge in pricing that if you bought now, you would have been able to take advantage of that. If you wait a year, a year or, a, or two from now, you may be at a point where people are saying it's unaffordable all over again. Right now, Florida is still affordable, especially compared to a lot of uh, markets people are coming from. A lot cheaper than uh, than in California, Illinois, New York, New Jersey, Connecticut. We're a lot cheaper. Our property taxes are a lot less and we have zero income tax. So a lot of advantages to be in Florida. And so if you look at the active listings, we're currently going up, right? Our, there's no doubt about it. Our, our active uh, listing uh, is going up, but we're still well below 2019. So we're actually seeing a medium back to the norm. And there may be some rental fluctuation, depending on the market you're in. You may see some areas have too much inventory, but just generally as a whole, Florida, we're still catching back up to where we were pre-pandemic. So uh, you can't look at the state of Florida all as a whole. You have to look at each market separately. And this is just looking at the market rents. And this is another thing worth mentioning is the rents in Florida have, or well, in the United States, have continuously gone up. Regardless of the economy, regardless of the recession, regardless of what's happening anywhere, rents have continued to go up. And I just showed you there isn't more inventory coming. We kind of already peaked that and rents are still going up. So it means that uh, even if you see prices come down or you see unemployment go up, you can anticipate that your rent will still go up just by looking at the historical numbers. So when we go through all that, we're now convinced, uh, great, it makes sense to buy new construction, it makes sense to buy in Florida. Uh, I'm very optimistic about what's going to happen over the course of the next two years. But I also mentioned that not all of Florida are exactly the same. So there's different parts of Florida you want to have a different strategy for. And so what we'll generally see is we think the best markets to invest in are markets where the, the, the land is cheap and the rents are high. That's the easiest way to look at it. So if you have expensive land, not a good place to invest. The rents are low, not a good place to invest. If the rents are low, uh, if, if the land is low and the rents are high, it's a great place to invest. Uh, and so we'll get people that say, hey, Alvin, do you have any duplexes in Miami? The answer is no. I wish it made sense to buy a duplex in Miami or to buy anything in Miami. I wish it made sense. Quite frankly, the land is just way too expensive. So we're avoiding areas where it's overly touristy dependent or any type of single economy is the main driver of that market. If it's way too expensive, if it's if it's expensive, it's more of a developer's, uh, I'm talking like multifamily apartment building where they're going to knock down a warehouse and build a hundred unit condo building on top of that. That's a kind of phase that some of these markets are in, especially in South uh, East Florida. We're not in those markets. We also don't like over touristy. So everything in the panhandle so Florida is the fastest growing state in the country. The panhandle is the slowest growing region of the state. Why would you invest in the fastest growing state, but invest in the slowest growing region? doesn't make any sense. So we avoid the panhandle altogether. Uh, sorry for all my friends in Tallahassee. Uh, and then we avoid areas that are too mature and that uh, you're kind of hoping gets gentrified. So, um, gentrification is something that's almost impossible to time. People can say that an area is going to get gentrified for years and it never occurs. Then all of a sudden it does and they feel like they're geniuses. Gentrification, uh, while you're waiting for it to eventually happen, which may never come, you can lose your shirt. You can go bankrupt waiting for something to, to get timed out correctly. So instead we like areas like, uh, like Jacksonville, which is a great mature city, a very strong job sector. Uh, Ocala, 
very robust, one of the lowest unemployment, one of the lowest insurance rates in the in the state of Florida. And it just it's beautiful to be there. Half of the horses that, that run in the in the Kentucky Derby come from Ocala. So it's a really great market to, to be in. We also like Southwest Florida quite a bit. Markets like Northport, uh, Port Charlotte, Punta Gorda, Kit Coral, Lehigh Acres, and even Fort Myers are our phenomenal markets. And they're clearly in that path of prosperity. If you look at that area uh, between Naples and Tampa, both of those are very expensive. Those are what we call your magnet cities. Uh, those are also your anchor cities. So if you're in between two markets like that, generally it's going to fill in great. And it's going to eventually mirror what those parent markets used to look like. And so we like Southwest Florida a lot. And then we also like areas that are a little bit unknown. Areas like Sebring and also areas like uh, Port, um, like Lake Placid and Port St. Lucie. They're a little bit under the radar, but they're coming up. And again, the, the data there is very strong. And we like those markets quite a bit. So um, a lot of times we get asked, like, hey, Alvin, we, we get it. We're into all this. Uh, but like, how, how does how does it work with you guys? How, why do you guys get these discounts? Why do you guys get these incentives? I, I don't get like why you're able to uh, put these kind of deals together. And um, the short answer is a lot of developers we work with, they're type A personalities. They like being on the field. They like completing projects. They like yelling at their crew. They like being in their truck. They like getting things done. And the last thing they want to do is negotiate something with a home buyer who wants to change the flooring, change a ceiling fan, change what that's not fun for them. Or we work with an outside realtor that has to then put it on the market at, who every single time is now working with a new uh, retail buyer and a new agent and just the negotiation, all the headings that go along with that. And if you think about it, they're going to, they're going to pay a premium because if they put the property on the market, um, before it's, um, before it's completed, now they're going to have high days on market. So people are going to, they see a house that's been on the market for two months. They're going to say, well, what's wrong with that property? Why hasn't that one sold already? Well, it's because it's not built. Or if they wait till the property is completed and now they put it on the market, well, now they're going to pay higher holding costs. So those are both more expensive propositions, let alone having a headache. They also now have multiple people in the deal. They have a listing agent and a buying agent that they both have to pay commissions to. And it's just more people to make the deal more complicated. And so uh, quite frankly, when they partner with us, we have over 10,000 investors who've already expressed interest in buying new construction properties. A lot of these are looking for turnkey solutions and they're just filtering out the options to figure out which one's the best one for them. Uh, investors are inherently more straightforward. If the deal works, they can close. Um, our average investor buys four properties from us and 80% of our inventory sold comes from repeat buyers. So they're buying in bulk, they're buying in volume, they're buying multiple times a year. And so that's a lot easier for an investor, I mean, for a builder to say, hey, we'll give you a 10% discount, uh, you know, because, you know, your team over there keeps selling through volume and we're getting these deals you know, out the door and closed on. And they're straightforward. They're, they're not a lot of, uh, if if the build takes a week longer, the investor does not care. Uh, however, if a homeowner has to be in a U-Haul truck and rent out an Airbnb for an additional week because the property's not ready, she's upset. <laughs> so, so investors are naturally a lot more just easier to work with. And because we can package these deals together, our investors, they have a lot easier job in finding an investment that works. Uh, we have more builders that want to work with us than we put on our inventory sheet. So we're, we're very selective. We also have a lot of experienced district managers who actually live in the markets that they serve. And they have on average 17 years of experience working with investors. So you're not meeting an idiot. You're meeting with someone who, who bought property, sold properties, who all they do is work with investors. And because we put a turnkey property in place, you're working with a team that has worked together multiple times. So this is not the first time the property management company you're working with has managed that property. They manage tons of those properties. They know the paint colors. They know the warranty company. Uh, they know they know the rental rates for that market. Uh, there's a lot of experience there. And just overall, there's just less drama. 
And so I spoke about this earlier. Our investors typically have a core competency. They're already good at something and they want to dedicate most of their brain cells to what they're already good at. But they realize that real estate investing is the most smartest way of, of investing their capital. The only problem is that buying real estate can be annoying and it's complicated. And so all we do is try to make it as easy as possible for our investors to identify, purchase, and manage their next property. So I'm highlighting a couple of different options here. Uh, we have single family homes, uh, duplex and quadplexes. We also have triplexes. We also have larger 105 unit developments. So we have a lot of different things going on. And so um, the point is we run the numbers for you. If you set an appointment with us, we'll show you the perform on day one. Uh, a lot of our investors like working with us because we get to the point very quickly. I always jokingly say that a traditional retail or conventional MLS uh, um, realtor, it's almost like going to a furniture store where they don't have any furniture. Uh, you're walking in, they ask you all these questions and they type into the computer what you just told them. And you're like, well, I could I could do that myself. I can go to Amazon and look for a furniture set myself. Why, why am I here if you don't have any furniture? So at Build to Rent, we are the furniture store with the furniture. Hey, if you want duplexes, there are duplexes over there. Hey, if you want a fourplex, hey, there's fourplexes over there. Hey, you're looking for a single family home? Yep, got plenty of single family homes over there. So we have the inventory already in place, ready to go. And we have all the numbers already mapped out. So uh, there's always going to be a different strategy depending on what you're looking to do. So if you're looking for more appreciation, we have several markets and properties that match that. If you're looking for more cash flow, we have some, if you're looking for a mix of both, we have something to do that. Uh, some of our investors are looking to put as many units under one roof as possible. We have several quadplex options and even larger deals available for those investors. And they all perform very well. Quite frankly, if they don't perform well, they don't make our inventory sheet. So we're not going to show you a bunch of options that don't pencil out. Um, all of them do. And then each of our properties have their own unique um, incentives. Um, but the key here is when we look at property, we want to look at the four ways that we build wealth through real estate investing, which is the cash flow. This is, you, you should have cash flow. If you don't have cash flow, your deal is dead. You should not buy it. Um, you also have the debt pay down. Every single month, your tenant is paying down your mortgage for you. Uh, I always jokingly say that every property is 75% off because you're only putting 25% down. Your tenants are paying down the rest. All you have to do is wait 30 years and you'll get a 75% discount on your property. The other part is the equity. There's two parts of equity. One is the day one equity, which is how much you bought that property below market value. The second is the annualized equity, which is how much your property goes up over value. The fourth one, it's a very important one. It's the tax benefits. And so we have a lot of high net worth individuals, uh, doctors, lawyers, business owners who don't care that much about making three or 400 bucks a month in cash flow. What they do care about is reducing their taxable income. And so there are a lot of tax strategies that work great for a higher end individual, for every individual, quite frankly, but particularly to those that are high earners. And there are strategies such as standard depreciation, uh, a bonus depreciation, and even using a cost segregation report to be even more aggressive with um, reducing your taxable income. And so this is one of our typical examples that I like looking at. And you know, when you decide you're going to buy a long-term hold, it's not just to have one property. I, I always say that the goal in life, at least for me it is, is to become a grandparent. And so you become a grandparent when your babies make babies. Well, the same is true when you're a real estate investor. The goal is to become a grandparent is you want your properties to make properties. It's true. I'm going to show you. So if we look at the top line there, just market value going across the board, and this is focusing on a Jacksonville quadplex, is we're going to say, hey, step number one, we're going to buy the quad, which is what we have there. And... Um, and so we're going to see the market value of that property go up over the course of five years. Then we're going to say uh, the tenant's paying down my debt each and every month. So my loan balance goes down each and every year. Now, in this example, we are not looking at cash flow. We are not looking at tax benefits. We're simply looking at the market value going up and looking at the loan balance going down. So each and every year, your equity position improves. 
So at the end of five years, you can do a cash out refi. Now, when you do a cash out refi, you're getting a new mortgage to replace your existing mortgage. But because your loan balance had went down over the course of five years, you're going to have excess funds. So when you do a cash out refi, you're going to have extra money that you can do whatever you want to do with. And so that excess fund, in this case, potential cash out refi, is over $618,000. Again, this is just property appreciation and your debt pay down. So when you get $618,000, it is not a taxable event because technically it is borrowed money and you don't pay taxes on borrowed money. So uh, when, you do it, when, you, when you do a cash out refi, you still own the property and you're still going to have 25, 30% equity still in the deal. So you're not taking all the equity out. But now that's enough cash to go ahead and buy two more quadplexes. So in the span of just buying one quadplex, you can now have up to 12 units in five years without putting any additional funds in the deal. You're simply making a smart decision once. You're buying a quadplex. You're going to wait five years. At year five, do a cash out refi. And now you can have up to 12 units. So you're going to have three quadplexes. So what happens if you wait another five years? Well, now you can do it again. Uh, so the goal is you want to, when you start getting wealthier and you start owning assets, now you're like looking at these assets you own and you're saying like, hey, what's the right trigger? What's the right move? What's the right timing on these things? But we're not using any additional earnings anymore. We're just reshuffling the deck. We're just, uh, we're, we're doing what's called portfolio management. And this is how wealthy people continue to gain wealth without working harder. They're having the assets work for them as opposed to other people working for their liabilities. So the, the plan here is to buy a quad, wait five years, cash out refi, buy two more. And then what you can do is at year 10, do a 1031 and do an even bigger project. You may want to buy a 16 unit apartment building, but you're going to scale very quickly if you learn how to reshuffle the decks correctly and um, and actually manage your assets correctly. So we also do several larger builds as well. And so one of the smaller builds that we have is a, a 14 unit uh, construction build happening in Cape Coral, Florida. But we also have several larger ones. And what we saw over the years was we had some investors that would buy our more one through four unit properties. And we had some that had a bigger appetite. They wanted to buy more. At the same time, some of the developers that were building a lot of smaller projects also wanted to scale up. So it was a perfect opportunity to both work with our investors and also work with our developers to do larger community projects. And so what we're seeing here is one of them is a, a 12 uh, quadplexes community uh, in Jacksonville, Florida. That's They're COing this month. So it's already nearly completed. Uh, and you can take over the project either now at closing, right? Once it's once it's completed, or, or when it's stabilized, if it's still available. We also have some that are in the earlier stages of being development. This one has raw dirt with permits, the one in Ocala, and that's going to be a 47 quadplex community. So um, we're seeing the trend go towards more zoning. We're seeing the demand in Florida continue to go up, and these larger projects are going to solve for that affordability problem that a lot of people are looking for. And we're not going crazy high end. So these are not going to have a whole gym. These are not going to have a whole pool set. The, the point is we want to make sure that operational costs stay low and we want to make sure the rental rates stay low. These are designed to be affordable, very functional housing that does well regardless of the economy. Uh, and then we also have uh, Holy Hills, by the way, is just north of Daytona Beach. And this is actually right near the water. It's a beautiful opportunity. That's 68 uh, connected townhomes. Uh, they're two story each driveway and and the downstairs and they're they're all lined up in a row. Really beautiful community and they they're all have waterfront view. So really cool development there as well. So this is our our new build for rent development, uh, uh, community development division, and this is designed for you know groups that are looking to take down larger projects. And so um, our Florida team consists of fourteen district managers throughout the state of Florida. Uh, we act, we're actively here. We live here. We know the markets. Um, we're readily available. We'll be happy to shake your hands or we'll be happy to do everything virtually uh, when it comes to touring the property, doing the inspections, all that kind of stuff. But we are active here in, in the market and our average 10 years over 17 years. 
And if you wanted to connect with us, the easiest way to do so is just to go to buildtorent.com. Uh, you're going to see what right in front of you where it says either schedule an investor consultation and you would schedule a call with one of us. Uh, and during that call, we're going to take time to get to know your story, understand your investment goals that you have. We're going to be able to explain our build to rent process, and we're going to start walking you through our inventory. Now, generally, that, that first call is a good get to know you. We're going to kind of go into a deep a little bit. We're going to answer some of your questions. But when you review the inventory sheet, you're going to have a lot of options and information available. So all of our everything on our inventory sheet includes performas that are very detail oriented, have that same five year projection that I just showed you guys earlier. You're going to be able to click on the plan that shows the spec sheet with all the included features of the properties. It's going to show you a video tour of the property. You're going to be able to see what materials are used in the home. You're also going to be able to see um, photos of the finished product. And so you're also going to have an opportunity to see all the completion dates of our deals including all the incentives that are attached with the purchase of a deal. So you get a lot of information from day one right away by just clicking on our inventory sheet. And then by um, starting that partnership, starting that relationship with our district manager, is we're going to begin to coach you on which investment makes the most sense for you, given your goals. All of our investors have different goals, and our job is to help you identify the right property to meet your goals. We're not at all salesy or pushy. It's all about you and your goals and trying to help you troubleshoot on which opportunity makes the most sense for you. And you can also go to our YouTube page where we have videos of all of our inventory available. Uh, you'll be able to see our models, uh, but obviously there's, it's going to be a big tease. The big victory or the big learning is going to happen when you schedule a call with one of our district managers. Uh, so with that said, we have gone well over our time. <laughs> I, you know, it, this was never designed to be an hour long meeting, but it also wasn't designed to go an hour and 40. So I, I definitely um, appreciate um, everyone's time in joining and sticking around. Uh, it is Friday. So I, I, I know it means a lot that you could be out uh, doing happy hour somewhere. And instead you chose to be with us. I'm going to stick around for one or two minutes. If you have any questions, uh, please put it in the chat. Uh, if I don't see anything, I'm going to sign off. So uh ask your questions quickly if you can. Um, but I, you know, while I wait for a question to come in, I, I'll, I'll explain a little bit as to what my why is and why I'm so passionate about what I'm doing. Because again, I'm essentially financially free. Um, so, but my why comes from actually working with my father. And so when I was in high school and in, in college, uh, I worked very closely with him to acquire a lot of properties and rehab properties. And I felt that we weren't doing a lot of things correctly. Uh, at that time period, it was very easy to hold on to, to buy properties. They were giving loans out to anybody. And uh, but he would just acquire properties. And the goal was to flip them and sell them. But I realized we weren't flipping them quickly enough. We were spending a lot of time rehabbing the properties and not getting them sold. And my father, being more of an immigrant mentality, felt that he could save money doing a lot of the labor himself. And so after, you know, going back and forth with him multiple times, he ended up not listening to me. And in the last recession, he actually lost a lot of the investments he had, including three bakeries that he owned. And so um, I always felt a little bit uh, like I saw what was happening and I kind of saw the writing on the wall a little bit. And if we would have sold a lot of them and maybe held on to one of them or two of them, we would have been fine. We would have been able to survive, but we just weren't operating at, at the pace in which we needed to, to be successful. And we got caught, he got burned. And and quite frankly, my father never kind of reached that peak again, that um, that was a very uh, devastating moment for, for him and, you know, his business aspirations. And um, people ask me why I care about real estate. It's quite frankly, a, a part of me, as silly as it as it seems, is I need to be successful in this field to demonstrate to my father that I know what I'm talking about. I know what I'm doing. So I've been on a mission for the last years as a, you know, while I was an investor myself to build my own wealth, to make sure that I was safeguarding myself and not having the same downsides. And a big part of it to me is to make sure other investors don't go through the same thing. 
So I have no problem talking about the pitfalls of real estate. I have no problem talking about the pitfalls of the market or what's happening in the industry because my goal is I've seen the benefits of real estate. I've seen massive amount of wealth, but I've also seen the downsides. And so if we can maximize the benefits of real estate while avoiding the downsides. That's a huge victory. And that's why I'm so passionate about the industry, even though I could just selfishly just do my own deals and that's it. Uh, but I definitely care about this. I want to see more wealth being created from ordinary Americans. I don't like the fact that so much wealth is concentrated at the top. And I see real estate as being a way for a lot of people to find that upward mobility. So that's why I'm passionate about real estate. That's my why. That's why I care about um, helping uh, investors like yourself. And I currently do not see... Oh, okay. I see four questions. All right. So... Uh, so uh, Joy asked if there's, so I got emotional there for a little bit. Uh, good for uh, Joy to cheer me up here. Uh, so any restrictions with property management company and cost at the end of two years? So, so the answer is no, um, even from the very beginning. Uh, so everything we do is we try to make it as turnkey as possible, but ultimately you're the owner of the property. So if you wanted to forego two years of free property management and manage it yourself, you have the right to do so. Uh, if after a year, you know, you want to go a different route, you can. So there's no restriction as to who you have to go with. But most of our investors go down by they work with our preferred vendors because we inherently have incentives attached to them. Um, anonymous attendee also ask about the two years and if they can self-manage and move in. Uh, the answer is yes. So move in. We've seen a, uh, a huge surge in um, owner-occupied um, loans buying especially the quadplexes in jacksonville we've seen a lot of own and it's absolute genius so if you think about for fifty thousand dollars you can acquire a million dollar asset that's insane and you know you're only required to live in the property for a year after that year you can move out and now you own a million dollar asset that's cash flowing for you uh, now there is going to be pmi so you want to be aware of that but um, you're going to be able to likely uh, get out of that PMI after the first year. Uh, so the way that you, so the PMI is a private mortgage insurance. That's the amount that you pay in insurance because you didn't put a full 20% down. And so you can often remove that by reaching out to your lender and telling them that you want to do an appraisal on the property showing that you have 20% equity in the deal. Uh, most times this is done electronically and no one actually goes to the property. They do an online assessment and they just remove your PMI. So if you, you know, live in a property for a year, move out of it, remove the PMI. Now you're going to cash flow very well for a very, very small investment. And quite frankly, that's one of the easiest paths to become a, a millionaire is simply buy a million dollar asset and have someone else pay for it. Um, so the question is, how much is the property management cost on the quadplex in Jacksonville and uh, and the duplex in Ocala? So uh, the property management uh, for most of our inventory is going to be two years free. And then it goes to either five or eight percent, depending on the property management team there. Uh, that's typically how that's worked. But the short answer is free for Ocala and Jacksonville. Um, who is the preferred lending partner? Uh, at any center, a loan from another lender. So the, the, the loans have to be for our lending partner. And the way that it's structured is um, we have a unique relationship where we're able to do that. If you go to any other lender and you say, hey, do you do a forward commitment? The answer is going to be no. Most lenders are not creative enough to solve for these kind of problems, which is why we do that. The lender is going to be specific to the property. So um, the best way to find out is to actually meet with one of our district managers, uh, start figuring out which models make and areas make the most sense for you. And now we're going to be able to attach the preferred property management company um, to um, that model that you're most interested in. But that's going to be property specific. Uh, any restrictions on being able to sell the property, for example, um, one of the four units sold? So when you buy a property, uh, you own it. You are the owner. This is not a syndication. You're not investing with anyone else. You are the owner. You can do with it what you want. Uh, now, the quadplex, as an example, is zoned as a single property. 
So you can't sell one of the four units if you wanted to. You'd have to sell the entire quadplex. Uh, but any property you own, you own it. So if you wanted to put a fence on it, you can. If you wanted to install ceiling fans, you can. If you want to change the blinds or do anything else to the property, you own it. If you wanted to turn it to a short-term rental, uh, you could. Uh, you're the owner of the property. Uh, but for the quadplexes, you would have to sell the entire quadplex. You wouldn't be able to just sell a unit at a time. Uh, at least not without going through a lot of paperwork and headaches with the city. And more than likely, they're going to deny your ability to subdivide that and make it into condos as opposed to single quadplex. Uh, property management, 5 to 8%. Uh, uh, so, so yeah, so a when you when you enter a, a traditional property management agreement, is going to be a 10 to 12% of the rental rate received. So for example, if the rent is $2,000 and the property management is 10%, they're going to charge you 200 bucks a month to manage that property for you. That's how most um, property management um, contracts work. So um, our, our, again, we pre-negotiate these and it's worth mentioning why we're able to get better rates our property management companies are trying to grow their book of business and they also want to manage the best properties. I mean, I'm a licensed broker and I don't want to be a property manager. That's, that's just not a fun profession for me. Uh, there is inherent a lot of brain trauma that comes with being a property manager. And so property management companies have a premium on just easier properties to manage. And so when they view our inventory, they view that this is a lot easier to manage because uh, it's brand new. They all have warranty. I know who to call if something breaks in the property, right? The warranty company that offsets it. I'm going to get a higher quality tenant. That tenant's going to pay a premium to live there. Uh, they're going to, because they have something to lose, either credit score, a job, whatever, they're going to take better care of the property. Uh, when you're more in your D-class communities is when you're going to find people who have nothing to lose. They would do whatever they want with the property. But when it's a little bit nicer of a property, when it's a newer construction, people care about it a bit more. It's also pretty obvious if something's broken or wrong, who did it? It's a brand new property. You're the only person who lived in it. So it, it, it's you, right? So they 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 often want to have more of this type of book of business. And so their mission is to do a great job servicing your property so that after two years, you can go ahead and pay them the five or 8% uh, and you'll be happy to continue having that partnership. But yeah, so when we do the math, it's it's going to be 5 or 8% of the rental rate, of, of the monthly rental rate, should I say. Um, so that's the bulk of the questions. Uh, again, I I want to thank everybody who's been, um, who stayed on today. I uh, greatly appreciate it. It's Friday. Uh, and so definitely, uh, I, I always try to practice being grateful, I'm grateful for all of you guys. Uh, also, you know, tell your kids, tell your parents how much you love them as well. Uh, and just, you know, if you have any questions, if you need any help or assistance, reach out to us, you can go to build to rent.com to uh, get additional questions answered, uh, schedule an appointment with one of our district managers, click on our inventory list to get our full list of inventory. And I look forward to working with you guys next time. Enjoy the rest of your Friday. Okay. Thank you.